based on this book of Swami Kriyananda's Demystifying Patanjali. Uh, in our last class, <laughs> where we can completed all of two, two sutras, sutras. <laughs> we of course talked a lot about vrittis, which one way to define a vritti is that they are self-definitions. They're just different ways that we kind of condition our limitless soul to be in that particular moment, limited to that narrow expression. So we thought, let's start with a chant that breaks those limitations and reminds us once again of our true potential. And this is a chant that was Shankaracharya, Swami Shankaracharya, the Adi Shankaracharya, was a poem that he recited to his guru when he was nine years old. Mm. When the guru asked him, who are you? <laughs> and he just went into this moment where he says, I am neither this, I am neither that, I am not this, I am not that. I am spirit, I am the blessed spirit. So let's kind of awaken that thought in our own hearts as well.
Let's use the power of this chant. To refer back to us with the same question. Who are we in truth? We are not this body, this mind. the intellect, the ego, the feeling. I am the spirit. And this is what the great ones have realized and have come down on earth to show us the way. And such great one, one of them, was the great sage Patanjali. Which brought this consciousness and give us the opportunity to explore ourselves through these sutras. So let's humbly open ourselves to receive from this founding of knowledge that he achieved, that he channeled out into the world to his disciples and to this day to each one of us. Let's go into that silence where true knowledge and wisdom can be perceived intuitively You may be wondering where we are because we have a very new setting in our background, which is always a lovely change. We're at our new home. Now Narayani and I have shifted from the ashram to a place just next door. Uh, and at the ashram, we're kind of refurbishing and doing the entire place up, trying to create a new altar and a new space. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll get the opportunity to share that with you. Until then, we'll have all our programs here, including meditations and all our classes. Back to Patanjali now. We have started with the Samadhi Pad. We only did two verses, first and second, and now we're on the third. But before we go to the third, because we're dealing with sutras, and one thing we talked about, about the quality of a sutra is that it's a thread, and so it weaves through. We can't just say, oh, this is where we are now. We always have to make sure that we're weaving through the right context. And so just remember the first 
uh, sutra was, now we come to the study of yoga. Now we begin this discipline. And that word now, as we saw, was very loaded. It was a question we must ask ourselves. Are we, in fact, now ready for yoga? The second sutra was yoga is the neutralization of the vortices of chitta. All right, so now that you're ready, this is what it is. This is what you have to do. The third sutra is then, so we had a now, and we have a then, spiritually free, the sage abides tranquilly in his inner self. You know, Spatanjali would have pretty much closed the book and said, I think I've said enough. I told you, are you ready? I've showed you how, you know, what you need to do. And I'm telling you what's going to happen once you've achieved it all. To a certain degree, the first three sutras already are those three philosophies, Shankhya, Yoga, and Vedanta. Shankhya says, you know, what all does it take to get ready? Why must we? find and seek a way out of delusion. Why must we turn inward in the first place? So the why, and that's the now. Now are you ready? Have you had enough? And then yoga is the what. What must I do now to achieve that state? And then Vedant. Vedant is it? Yeah. <laughs> Vedant comes and suddenly I thought of Vedant, our friend Vedant. I was like, that doesn't sound right. And Vedant, the ant of the Vedas, the end, what comes after. Once you have achieved yoga, what do you experience? Well, then spiritually free, the sage abides tranquilly in his inner self. Sounds simple enough. Well, just three stages, you know, when one, two, three, couldn't be too much to it. And sometimes we do feel that the spiritual path should be simple enough. We read these things, we see the lives of saints and we say, that seems simple enough. You know, they just, what did it take him? Just a couple of years? I, I think I could do that. All of us, maybe not you, but I, I'm especially guilty of that. I thought I'll come onto the path three years maximum. <laughs> just like maximum three years. And I just okay, meditate every day, just go deep within, have these amazing experiences, you know, chitta after chitta just being flung. And, you know, <laughs> and then I would spiritually free, just abide completely tranquilly in my own inner self. Of course, I'm still trying to figure out what the inner self is. Because, and I don't want to spend time here because it's very obvious what's more important to each of us is the next sutra. What happens when we don't do? <laughs> when we're not able to achieve yoga? And then he says, otherwise, so you've got a then, then you've got an otherwise, there's the caveat. Oh, if you're not able to, or if you couldn't follow step one, two, and three, <laughs> And let's see what's going to happen. Otherwise, if one hasn't found inner peace, the vrittis cause the indwelling self to assume many outward forms. Otherwise, that's what the vrittis are. You see, that's the interesting quality of the vritti. The energy of the vritti is always directed outward. There are two polarities to vritti, and we'll see that. There's an upward polarity and there's a downward polarity, but it does not take you inward, it takes you outward. Upward and outward, or downward and outward. And that's what the vritti will always do. Every time, as we try to go deep in meditation, our thoughts, where are they trying to take us? Outside of ourselves. The restlessness of the body, bring the energy back out. And that's what each of the vrittis do. But they assume many outward forms. And I was thinking about it from the perspective of, we don't therefore know our true selves because we're only yet been acquainted with the many outward forms. We only know ourselves as man and woman and, you know, Indian or Spanish or, you know, beautiful or not so much or fat or thin or like this or like, don't like that, want this and don't want that. That's all we know of ourselves. So when I was thinking about it in the context of the Mahabharata, and that's why, you know, we've got this entire thing of all these indwelling uh, aspects of our consciousness. We're actually all those characters. At times, I am Arjuna. At times, I am Duryodhan. At times, I am Shakuni. At times, I am Bhishma. At times, I am... And I'm a split personality of a billion different forms. From that perspective, as I was thinking about it, I suddenly had a very kind of respectful moment for the ego. 
Because the only thing tying all these forms is the ego. If we didn't have that I, we would be torn apart. We couldn't figure out what's going on, who is coming at what time, and suddenly I'm acting this way, and now suddenly I feel this way, now I'm hungry, and now I'm sleepy, and now I want that, and now... And there's nothing to tie it all together, and each is a completely different character. Sometimes I'm the sweetest person, and sometimes I'm a monster. Sometimes I'm uplifted and inspired, and sometimes I don't want to get out of bed. And this isn't sure, Joe. This is Bob and John and Rahul and, you know, Shweta and, I mean, you can give them any name. Ved Vyas gave them all the names of the characters of Mahabharat. But imagine that. We don't even know who Shurjo is. Except Shurjo is that one eye that he has tied Rahul and Shweta and, you know, whoever else and Ishani and Chitra and Shamini and Bara and we're all of these because to a certain degree, we're so influenced by one another, we're probably expressing aspects of each other all the time. And that's part of that omnipresent consciousness and reality. We're not ourselves. <laughs> we're just the sum totality of the influences that we've received and experienced. So when I think about, well, otherwise you're just, you have no idea who you are. Otherwise, you're just all these different things, and it's always going to be outward. And so that's the quality of the vritti, and that's an important quality always to kind of understand. Because anything that draws the energy outside of yourself, one way or the other, good or bad, is the very function and the result of a vritti being awakened. The fifth sutra says, there are five classifications of vrittis. Oh, this is very scientific. <laughs> oh, vrittis have classifications. All right, let's find out. And he says, painful and painless means all five, each of them are both painful or painless. And that's the polarity here. Every vritti will either be painful or painless. And I love uh, Patanjali <laughs> not saying painful and pleasurable. <laughs> You know, painful and painless. He said, for him, pain is still, <laughs> for him, pain is the bottom line. Either there's going to be pain or there'll be absence of pain. And it's because he doesn't want to quantify that upward flow of feeling that is caused by a vritti. He doesn't want to quantify it as happiness. Because otherwise we get confused. We start thinking, oh, oh, this is not so bad. Oh, this vritti is pretty good because I feel great because of it. But Patanjali therefore wants to make sure that by two types ke hain, ya to pain hone wala hai, ya pain nahi hoga. The absence of pain will exist, but I won't even give it the positive term of happiness or joy, because neither of these two will create fulfillment. They won't create bliss. No vritti can take us to bliss. But there are five classifications to this painful and painless reality. The painful reality is when the vritti goes downward and a painless reality is when the vritti goes upward. Now the interesting thing about a vritti is it is both the cause of our bondage but it is also the key to our freedom. How so? At the end of the day, we need to keep creating vrittis. I know yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodh. But no matter what we do, vrittis are being created every moment, every thought. And we'll see what are these classifications of vrittis. So what we need to do, and this is the experience we need to have of what does it mean to live rightly in this world, is to create vrittis of the vibration that is as high up in the spine as is possible. Because vrittis are just magnetic vortices. So the higher up these vrittis are created, so of course they're all around us, all throughout the spine, and so they're either drawing our energy downward or they're bringing our energy upward. And the higher up these vrittis are created, the more the energy begins to move upward. And these will be the sattva quality of vrittis, these are the rajas qualities of vrittis, and then there's the tamasic qualities of vrittis. And so when we're thinking about how must I live as a yogi, and of course later on, 
Patanjali introduces the yamas and the niyamas, which is pretty much how to create amazing vrittis. How to create the best vrittis possible. Vrittis, nonetheless, will be created. And then the energy begins to move upward, we begin to experience painless vrittis, and then, hopefully, move in the direction of bliss. This is where the sixth sutra comes in. The vrittis are, and these are the five classifications, right and wrong conceptions of what is. So those are two. There's a right perspective, a perception of truth. There's a wrong perception of truth. Imagination, sleep, and memory. So this is how Patanjali thinks each of the vrittis are classified. The right conception, wrong conception, imagination, sleep, and memory. All vrittis in stirring the waters of feeling distort the reality that is soul bliss. As we were saying, no vritti actually will take you to soul bliss. Every vritti's job is to distort reality, which means even the right conception of truth is not truth itself. As Swamiji says over here, the right conception of truth is water is wet. But knowing that water is wet doesn't actually moisten your clothes. Master said, just writing H2SO4 on a piece of paper doesn't create sulfuric acid. So you may know what's true, but that's still a vritti. <laughs> Until truth itself becomes the only reality. And that'll only happen in the absence of a vritti. When there is nothing else confusing you, and bringing your energy outward. Now these are things that are very subtle and seemingly very hard. <laughs> wow, you know, even knowing the right thing is just a vritti, even moving in the right direction is just a vritti. And then of course there's wrong conceptions and there's imagination and there's sleep and memory and now he'll go into each one of those. And Swamiji here talks about those two polarities. Of course right and wrong is very simple. You've got imagination. You've got imagination that can help expand your consciousness. I mean, imagination, Yogananda said, is a, is a requisite on the spiritual path because it then leads eventually to pure and clear visualization of how you want to manifest your life. But imagination also takes us into uh, delusions and daydreams and living in a world that is completely unreal. Imagination is what created all the innovations in the world. Every scientist had to imagine a possibility and then move forward to prove that possibility. And then, of course, there's my imaginings. I think Narayani meant that when she said it. And then now I've created a whole you know, reality around my own imagination. And then sleep, of course, can be restorative or sleep can be a drug drawing us into greater and greater sluggishness, into dullness, into wanting to be subconscious most of the time, into not wanting to put out energy at all. And so every vritti is going to have both those realities. And memory, Swamiji says, is of course, either we get trapped in our memories, this is what that person did to me, and this is how they said that to me, or we learn from our memories, huh, last time when I did this, it didn't work out so well, now I'm going to do that instead. And so, again, every vritti can be used in either direction that we choose, which is again a very key element. I have control over where energy is going to go outward, it is a vritti, but I can choose how I'm going to use it. Eventually, memory is the one memory that I've come from God. We're going to find our way through memory. Patanjali defines Samadhi eventually as Smriti, that first memory that, ah, oh, wow, I actually came from bliss. And then that's what's going to draw us back. And that is what, in fact, is drawing us back in this moment. Let's see now what he says about right understanding. It's the seventh sutra. Right understanding comes from direct perception, inference, and valid authority. 
So this is how Patanjali says, right understanding comes from direct perception, inference and valid authority. I like the fact that he's got and there rather than or. It's not so much it either comes from direct perception or it comes from inference or it comes from valid authority. It comes from all three together. Now, the problem is we can't really <laughs> trust our direct perception, can't really trust our inference. And so what is valid authority? Well, in this particular case, Valid authority is the Guru. Is he who has already achieved yoga? Is the only valid authority? Nothing else, no one else. So let's think about it in, you know, just simpler terms. In our ashram over there, water is constantly leaking from the tanks once they overfill. And say I look out the window and my direct perception tells me water is falling, must be raining. Because that's what Rada, you know, that's my inference, right? Water's falling, it must be raining. But then I, uh, then Rajesh tells me, no, it's the water tanks. He's the valid authority here. He's outside, he's looking at it and he says, that's not rain, that's the tanks overflowing. Or I come out into the garden and I say, the you know, the grass is wet, it must have rained last night. And then Rajesh again, the valid authority says, no, I just watered the grass. So our direct perception and our inference is very limited. So we can see things, we can hear things, we can experience things, but it's very hard really to always know if that is in fact right understanding. And that's why I really appreciate him throwing that and valid authority, which means we need to keep referring our perception and our inference back to a valid authority. And wrong understanding, of course, he doesn't say it this way. He says it, let me say what he says first. Wrong understanding is mistaking the true nature of what is, of that which is being considered. But when I was reading this too, I felt wrong understanding is when we, do, when we rely solely on direct perception and inference, and we do not relate it back to a valid authority. Because it's so easy just to completely miss the point. Even on the spiritual path, even with valid authority, it is so easy to completely miss the point. I know what I want. <laughs> I know what I need. I know my guru is telling me I need this, but I know better than valid authority. Because I am more aware of my own feelings. I'm more aware of what I'm going through right now. I have direct perception of my own emotions. I have direct perception of all the people around me. I am the one who in fact knows. And that is where those vrittis, they're like, pakda gaya, phas gaya, finally. <laughs> because we're not looking to valid authority. We're not looking to Krishna. Arjuna knows how to, you know, fire a bow and an arrow. I mean, that's what he's trained for all his life. He's the best at it. What does he need Krishna for? He just goes out there, boom, 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 yaha mara vaham. I mean, just, but he needed valid authority. So don't get too excited about everything that you think you know. Don't get too comfortable in your own intuitions and perceptions and understandings. Go back to valid authority. Go back to somebody who has achieved yoga, chitta, vritti, nirod. Go back to some place where you can say, is this really true though? And this is really the game here. Because even right understanding is just going to take us so far, just as it's not actually truth. Right understanding is just, I now know which direction to move toward, period. It's not truth itself. So don't get too excited about right understanding either. It's just a vritti moving you in the right direction. And that's a beautiful distinction between these two perspectives for me. It's just that word, valid authority. Now you can choose your own valid authority and you can figure out whether or not in fact they are valid authorities, but at least there could be some 
check to what you're thinking. Always have a check. Don't assume your thoughts are right. Don't assume your perspectives are right because as Patanjali says, there's a right perspective, there's a wrong, and these are the only two little games that the Vrittis are going to play with us. And one's going to lead you to pain, <laughs> one's going to lead you to painlessness. And when I, we start moving in this direction, in the vow of discipleship, I love it every time I read that vow, there's a prayer that precedes the vow that says, Divine Mother, for too long have I sought you for myself and not for your love. Too long have I followed the winding path that leads to thee, but saying, I want this from life. I want that answer. I want that guidance. And that is where we get so confused. We think we know what we need. Let's go back to four. Let's see, do we really know what we need? Oh, otherwise the vrittis cause the indwelling self to assume many outward forms. Oh, I don't know what this indwelling self is. I'm just relating to those outward forms. Right now, Shurjo needs this, but tomorrow Rahul needs the other thing, and day after tomorrow Shweta needs something else, and then Shamini needs something else, Ishani needs something else, and who needs what? Who do you even know who needs? Because your vrittis are all over the place and right now you're expressing one outward form and so you assume this is what I need when I express this outward form. But tomorrow you express a different outward form and suddenly now you need something else. And then day after tomorrow you say, no, no, my perception of truth is now so clear because now I know exactly what I need. I need to relax more. <laughs> I need, I just need this. I've understood it. It's clear now to me. Have you checked? Checked with any valid authority? Has your guru somehow, truly, through everything he said, not just your intuition, not like, I think I know what my guru wants from me. Have you gone back to what he said in his words, what he's immortalized in his teachings? Are you referring to anything, anything at all, that could form some benchmark that says, is this really true? Because otherwise, really, really, really takes forever to figure this stuff out. There is no, I got it, you know, because even the right conception, Swamiji says, is still just a vritti waiting <laughs> to take you elsewhere. Even in moving in the right direction, there's still no guarantee that that right direction's taking you to the goal. Because there's other vrittis in there and they're all waiting to get in on the action. They're all saying, Mera mokka kab aayega? Shweta kab aayegi? Rahul kab aayega? That's the split personality. There was a movie which I don't remember the name of, but you remember Bruce Willis used to be in it and Samuel L. Jackson and there was this recently, it was called, I believe it's called Split. And there's this guy, he's the bad guy. And he's just got six different personalities because there's multiple personality disorder and sometimes he's just the sweetest guy and sometimes he's this murderous killer, which is, you know, and that's the two extremes, but all in between there are many different forms that he assumes. And one doesn't know the other. When he's the sweet guy, he has no conception that he's ever been a murderer. And that's really how we express ourselves in this world. What we're experiencing now, we take as biblical truth. And we say, this is it. And we commit ourselves to that vritti, completely clear. This is it. I found it. And then tomorrow, the next vritti. And then the next. And we continuously commit ourselves in these directions with no valid authority. Okay, <laughs> enough about that. Let's see what in that, where are we? Okay, wrong understanding done. What's imagination? Understanding that is based on untruth is imaginary. Understanding that is based on untruth is imaginary. Now that's a little, I was like, hmm, how's that different from wrong conception? Understanding that is based on untruth is imaginary. I realized that a lot of us, what we do is we weave stories. We weave 
entire scenarios. And what happens is when we don't have right perception, and when we create a wrong conception, and then we build an entire world around this wrong conception, Narayani is upset with me. I don't know. Narayani, are you upset with me? I must have done something, no. I'm sure. Today, no, the entire no. day, I did nothing to upset Narayani. <laughs> Narayani is upset with me. It's my wrong conception because what was my direct perception? She didn't greet me in the morning. She ignored my WhatsApp. She, you know, whatever. I mean, take 600 different ways. Now, I am quite convinced Narayani is upset with me. And then I'm creating and I'm weaving and I'm moving. And what's happening with that little vritti is that, oh boy, am I growing it. And now I've got this whole thing of, why must she have been? But also I, when I did that, yeah, yeah. Now I need to be upset with her. Because I think I didn't do anything wrong. And that last time when she did that thing wrong, I didn't get upset. So now is my turn. Now I'm going to do it. And I weave worlds and worlds and stories and stories and I live in them. And I just continue to live in them and I'm living in them and I'm living in them. And pretty soon, whether there was any truth, right or wrong, now there's just nothing of that. There is an entire new world. A complete new world created. And now, all my actions are based on that world. There is not even truth anymore. Wrong conception, Michalo, you still have a line that says truth and untruth, and I can either be on this side of it or I can be. Now I'm so far away from truth, and all ramifications are now based on that thought, that imagination, that projection of my own consciousness into the world, onto other people, onto circumstances. This is why this happened. This is what he must have meant, and so on and so forth. And imagination then takes us wherever it takes us, further and further and further and further away, because now I'm so far from because I have layers now. There was truth. There was the wrong conception of truth. Now there's what I've based on that wrong conception. Now I think that's the truth. And now everything that I live from that moment on. And I then live in a completely imaginary world. Most of us live in this imaginary world. All of us perhaps live in this imaginary world. And those create amazing vrittis create a whole host of movements in our spine that then make those imaginations real that's the great joy that we get any imagination you hold is going to have to fulfill itself any misconception of anybody treating you any different way expecting something that didn't turn out and therefore all of that's going to play out because now there is a flow of energy that needs to express itself. A magnetic pull of life force that's going to manifest. Sleep. Patanjali says, I love this. I mean, this guy is just, sleep is attachment to nothingness. Sleep is attachment to nothingness. Have you ever had this moment where somebody says, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You say, nothing. <laughs> Just like, nothing. <laughs> you know, we like, we like these moments where we just can glaze over. <laughs> just <be> like, <laughs> we're neither in imagination land. You know, we're, we're neither building our sand castles. We're just nowhere. We've just checked out. You know, and that's such a, that's actually a draw. It's a, it's a real pull. I mean, that's what sleep allows us to be. It's really just, you know, Master Aldo said, if you have no other solution, if you're like in the middle of this really difficult karma, nothing else is coming, the best thing to do is go to sleep. <laughs> just temporarily, because it's a, it's a withdrawal. It is an interiorization of life force. Just step away from it. Enter into temporarily that nothingness because to a certain degree and as I said in the right way it's restorative 
Master said, sleep is not a physical necessity. Sleep is a soul necessity because the soul cannot remain identified with this body so continuously without at least for a while escaping into the astral world. At least for a while disconnecting from it. And that is why people who are sleep deprived go insane. Literally, the mind, the body stops functioning. I remember we talked about it once somewhere. There was this experiment done with rats. I imagine that's what they'd love to do experiments with, where they didn't let the rat sleep at all. Just didn't let them sleep. They would keep, every time the rat wants to fall asleep, they'd awaken it in whichever way that they were doing. And in a couple of days, the rats died. And they were trying to figure out what made it die. And what made it die was multiple organ failures. Everything just shut down and they really couldn't figure out how because they were being fed they were moving i mean everything else that man or human or any living being needs water food you know whatever <laughs> spending time with other female rats and you know whatever they needed but they didn't get sleep and so from that perspective i said oh sleep's really important but in this particular case of course, he's not talking about physical sleep, is he? This attraction to nothingness, to need to dull. And this is where people love their alcohol, their drugs, their television. Because I can just check out. You just turn something on and I'm gone. And this is a very, very, again, crucial vritti within us, a classification of a vritti. Vritti is that guide us and draw us into wanting to be subconscious, not wanting to put out any energy at all, wanting to be dull, wanting to be tamasic, wanting to remain forever in this haze where no clarity exists, where nothing, you don't know where you are, which world you're relating to. It's you, it's worse to a certain degree even than that imagination. At least you're trying to achieve something there. Here, you're not interested at all. And then where do we go from here? Memory. Memory is clinging to and refusing to abandon any ideas of objects that return to your mind. In truth, all vrittis, to a certain degree, are memories, except for the ones that we're creating now, but they will become memories <laughs> in our next incarnation or a few years from now. Everything, and that's where, you know, habit comes in, is something we've already done because it's already an energy put into motion. So it's just all coming back to us. But here it is, memory is clinging to and refusing to abandon any ideas of objects that return to the mind. How much comes up again and again to our minds, over and over again, every thought, every experience, ah, well, same thing what Narayani did, said, I, me, them, whoever else, and then not being able to let that go clinging to it and refusing to abandon it. You see, this is where vrittis become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger because all this, all right conception is also a memory. Swamiji would say, you cannot accept spiritual truth if you've not already in a previous incarnation accepted it before. The reason why something, somebody says these beautiful words, two people are standing, a spiritual teacher is talking, one guy says, what nonsense, and one guy says, wow, it's only because of memory. So all these vrittis that we're talking about, these are five classifications, they're not, this is either right conception or this is wrong, they're all the same. They're classifications, and at each time, we're using one of these five to be the primary focus of how we're expressing that vritti. 
So all of it's memory, but when we're starting to, when we refuse to let it go, every time it returns itself, and that's all. We don't have to. Yogananda always said, the first thought is not your fault. The second thought is. So the first thought says, how could this person, how could this have happened? Take it, chodo. But the second thought is, then you really start thinking about how this could happen. And very soon you're in your imagination. And very soon you've got absolute wrong conception of the truth. And so on and so forth. And or right conception. There's nothing wrong with right conception too. It's just as binding. <laughs> but it's just moving us in the right direction. So you've got these five classifications. And it'll be a fun thing for us to tune in. To start tuning into them. Especially I love the right and wrong perceptions. And that'll be something that I'm going to have a lot more fun with. Hmm. <laughs> really test out my direct perception, is it? Can I really rely on it? You know, can I really say, yes, this is true, absolute truth? My thoughts, my words, my perspectives on this world. And then, of course, we can throw in their imagination and memory and sleep. And you can look and you can see, what are these Rithis? Oh, this pull towards dullness. Oh, there it is. That's the, you know, that's the <laughs> pull towards nothingness. Wanting to just check out. And then you can use that. You see, and that's why it's important. You can use every vritti. Rather than checking out, what if I do something that does give me that moment of nothingness, but it's also restorative. Rather than sleeping, what if I do shavasan? You know, same, similar, very similar, where well, one can take, be restorative and uplifting, one can be completely like a drug, like, oh, forget it, I don't want to deal with this problem again. And so, anyway, if vrittis exist, the least we can do is have fun with them. So, let's try that. <laughs> Fascinating. I mean, I don't know even from where to pick it up right now but one of the one thing for sure is like I can't be so sure about my own feelings anymore I mean <laughs> that's for sure something that really struck me today as never before I love the way that Swamiji describes British here he said they are self-developed inclinations self-developed inclinations desires and attachments and we feel that these desires these inclinations are not influenced these are ours i mean we are so sure and we are not influenced by even our own thoughts. We are just channeling them, direct perception for the universe in our meditations. But then Swamiji goes a step farther and he says, all our vrittis are influenced by our past deeds and their influences. I mean, oh my God, when I read that, like, wait a moment. <laughs> I'm not only influenced, but what I have created about my own perception of truth and wrong, by also that perception is influenced by my past life's <laughs> influences. And it just keeps going And on. it just keeps going backwards and backwards <laughs> and backwards, and it just really makes you stop and start redirecting your daily perceptions. And I was thinking there are two ways where how we can handle this when a feeling comes, a thought pattern. We can whether introspect and analyze how we feel, what we are channeling and, and see meditate about it. And the other way to go about it is Everything that comes, I'm just going to set it aside for a while because I don't want to dwell too much on it in case it will take me 
very far from the real truth. And this is something I have felt inspired today throughout this class to practice. Throughout this week, I'm not going just to stop and analyze how I'm feeling, how that triggered me, why this person did that, why the other person looked to this other person this other way, you know, whatever that might be. Whatever second thought comes into my mind, I'm going to develop that kind of willpower that will immediately set aside that thought and discard it completely because it has the potential to bring me downward. So if we want to create new vrittis that will take us at least outward but upward, it requires a lot of strictness with ourselves and not really dwell into however we are feeling at that very moment because even that feeling has been influenced by our past karma. So this is a serious stuff that's going on with us every minute, every thought, every time we look at a person, we have already a preconception about that person that comes from who knows when. So I would invite each one of us perhaps to give it a try. What it means for me from now onwards, every time a thought comes, a feeling, to set it aside immediately and redirect my energy when in that very moment, I'm already creating a completely new thought pattern, new vridit who has nothing to do with my past, but I'm working with my future. And I'm bringing an energy that will bring me upward. And this new way of thinking, I also need to make sure that it's mostly as much as I can from this upper part of my body. It has to have high energy, a little bit of restlessness. It has to have dynamism. It has to have kindness expansiveness, perhaps it has to have a, a feeling of joy and, and, and work with that energy because the more you use the energy from these upper chakras to create new vrittis automatically, you are already attuning yourself with higher realities. You are stepping into automatically a higher level of consciousness. And that's the way of the yogi. That's the battle that we are constantly fighting. And, and today, somehow, I'm, I'm very grateful that I gained a new understanding and, and a new way to want to practice the teachings at that level where I'm going to see what happens when I don't just think too much about that particular episode, about that particular person, about that particular project, about that particular feeling, about myself, because I don't even know who I am. I'm so influenced by my past, by the people around me, by the mass consciousness, by the position of the sun, by the position of the earth, by my own horoscope, by the food that I'm eating, I'm so influenced that I cannot trust that what I'm feeling right now, <laughs> it's coming from my highest self. So that's the practice for this week that I would like for each one of us to give it a try, just for a week, and see what it does to our energy field, to our thoughts, to our meditations, to our interactions, to our relationships. And, and let's explore, let's put the teachings into practice in a, in a serious way and see what this does for, for us and our own attunement with that valid authority. Because if we do the work, 
if we really start working seriously, that authority will be there to just making sure that, yes, or giving us a confirmation or, or reassuring us, yes, this is the way to go. So let's just take a moment, just a few minutes, perhaps two or three minutes, to, to meditate a bit about all that was said, those moments of true soul understanding, that recognition that, wow, I want to do this. I want to practice this. I want to become aware that I just, I just need to be careful in giving power to those thoughts, to those vrittis, that the only thing they are doing is just taking me astray, astray from the path deeper and deeper into delusion and a way to slap our faces is just not to pay attention to them and forcefully to set them aside and to redirect our energy Yogananda said to his disciples, what do you think it took me to become a master? A constant fight against Maya, against delusion, against the hypnotism of thinking and perceiving myself in a way that I am not. And this is the true practice of self-mastery. So how are you going to practice it? this week? What are those tendencies, inclinations that you have been indulging in but are not helpful anymore? And are you ready and willing to work with them? Let's go into that silence to regain uh, renewed strength and resolution for the week ahead. So we can be blessed by that valid authority in the form of your guru. in the form of that particular person or energy that you are asking help and guidance from.
And before we open our eyes, let's inwardly offer a prayer of gratitude to this great sage, Patanjali, and the opportunity that he's given us to get to know his consciousness and his approach to freedom. and inviting each one of us to discover ourselves and to free ourselves. Have a fabulous rest of the week and we'll come back next Thursday and see <laughs> what else Patanjali wants us <laughs> to be working on. God bless us all, Jai Guru. Mm-hmm.